Two Gripen E-jets suddenly locked onto Russian MiG-31s with Meteor missiles. The Russian pilot screens were flashing warnings like crazy. Everything was turning red. This was an unexpected situation. As the Russian pilots tried to deal with the sudden threat posed by the Gripens, their cockpit threat displays suddenly filled with multiple high-priority contacts. Suddenly, F-35A Lightning IIs appeared. The MiG-31s had fallen into an electronic trap, unable to comprehend what was happening. And soon, the Russian pilots would make the biggest mistake not only of their careers, but also of their country. It all began when three Russian MiG-31 Foxhound fighter jets took off rapidly from Chkalovsk Air Base. They immediately climbed to 45,000 feet and began advancing along their route over enemy airspace. Their speed and high-altitude capabilities gave them a sense of invincibility. At the designated point, the MiG-31s entered Estonian airspace, feigning a deliberate navigation error. The pilots felt confident and almost bored in their cockpits. Their transponders were off, their formation was aggressive, and their route was specifically designed to play with NATO's nerves. The Russian pilots were aware that they were being closely monitored. This was no secret. However, their critical mistake was completely misinterpreting the nature and purpose of this surveillance. They assumed they would receive a standard NATO warning a few minutes later, perhaps be gently escorted by a pair of F-16 taking off from Lithuania, and then return to their base like heroes after this minor show of force. That's why the pilots were flying at 45,000 feet, which is low altitude for a MiG-31, because they wanted to be found by the F-16. The MiG-31's Mach 2.83 speed and 82,000 foot altitude were impossible for the F-16s to reach. An F-16 jet could not fly above 50,000 feet, which would spoil the Russian pilot's fun. Even if NATO air defense systems could reach the range, it would be very difficult to hit a target at the speed of a MiG-31 at an altitude of 25,000 meters. This is why the Russian pilots were so confident. However, this assumption would soon turn into the biggest mistake of their careers. NATO's Combined Air Operations Center, CAOC UDEM in Germany, had labeled these three MiG-31s as high priority from the moment they took off from Kaliningrad. But the order given that day was not a standard scramble, emergency takeoff order. The order contained extreme coldness and calculated patience. Allow the targets to enter our airspace. This was not a moment of weakness, it was an invaluable opportunity. And what followed would render the Russian MiG-31 completely useless. As the Russian MiG-31 fleet advanced over the Gulf of Finland, north of Estonia's Hiuma Island, Every minute spent in Estonian airspace increased the Russian pilot's confidence. The fifth minute. The tenth minute. They were joking on the radios, interpreting NATO's lack of response as cowardice. The powerful Zaslan M passive electronically scanned array, PESA, radars were scanning a wide area, but detecting no threat. The screen showed only civilian traffic and empty space. However, while they were searching for something, they themselves had already been located, classified, and targeted. While they thought they were flying alone in Estonian airspace, they suddenly became the guests of honor at a very crowded party. About 80 kilometers southwest, two F-35s took off from Amari Air Base in Estonia. These two Italian F-35A Lightning IIs, on patrol duty, were flying in completely passive mode, flying at a much lower altitude and in complete electronic silence. MCON, the two Italian F-35s were tracking the MiG-31s step by step. The F-35's AN-APG-81AESA radars, operating in LPI, low probability of intercept mode, which is nearly impossible to detect, recorded every movement, speed, altitude, and engine heat of the MiGs, creating a weapon-quality target file for them. However, the F-35's presence could not be detected by the MiG-31's older generation radar warning receivers, RWR. Therefore, the Russian pilots did not sense any danger. The F-35's were operating like electronic vacuum cleaners. Every electromagnetic signal emitted by the MiG's radars, data links, and communication systems, every frequency hop, every power fluctuation was being sucked up, recorded, and instantly transmitted via AWACS to NATO intelligence centers for analysis. This was an autopsy of the electronic soul of Russia's most important fighter jet, and the other players on the scene had also taken their places. Dozens of kilometers to the west, two Swedish-made JAS-39 Gripen-E aircraft, fed by the Link-16 data link flowing from the F-35s, 
were flying on a parallel route with their radars turned off. These were no ordinary Gripens, they were the fleet's top-tier versions. While it had no official nickname in aviation circles, it was an open secret that the Gripen E was designed with a single primary adversary in mind. Advanced Russian Fighters and Air Defense Systems Its Raven ES-05 AESA radar, sophisticated electronic warfare EW and jamming suite, and most importantly, its ability to use the sensors of all other friendly elements in a network as if they were its own eyes, made it a true Russian hunter. Its mission was to electronically blind the enemy before seeing it, hunt it down using data from the network, and disappear if necessary. A single word order came from CAOC Udom for the Gripen fighters. Engage! Just as the Russian pilots were thinking, this is too easy. The world in their cockpit suddenly collapsed. First, the screens of the Zaslon M radars filled with meaningless signals, interference, and false targets. For a moment they thought it was a system malfunction, but then their communication systems also cut out with static. Seconds after the electronic attack, the MiG-31's radar warning receivers began screaming at a previously unheard intensity and power with a radar lock. This was not a malfunction. This was an attack. Within seconds, looking out the cockpit windows, they saw two JAS-39 Gripen E aircraft in climb position, their wingtips loaded with the latest generation Meteor and IRIST air-to-air -air missiles. Both Gripen E aircraft had activated their radars and locked onto all three MiGs simultaneously. Without even establishing visual contact, the Gripen E aircraft had completely crippled the MiG-31 fleet's electronic awareness using their advanced electronic warfare suites. They had left them blind and deaf. By the time the Russian pilots noticed them, the Gripens had already moved into ideal firing positions and released their missile locks. It was a complete tactical surprise. As the Russian pilots reeled from the shock of this sudden threat, their threat screens lit up further with the activation of F-35s. Now, they were not only blind and deaf, but also completely trapped. In the midst of this chaos, two Gripen fighters appeared calmly and professionally right next to the MiG-31s, as if on a training flight. The seeker heads of the Meteor missiles under their wings were pointed at the Russian aircraft. The Meteor missiles left the MiG-31s completely helpless because they were traveling at Mach 4+. The Swedish pilot's voice came over the emergency frequency, cold as ice. Russian fighter jets, you have been in Estonian and NATO airspace for 12 minutes. Your electronic systems are under our control. Your radars are inoperative. Multiple missiles are locked on your position. You have one option. Return immediately to Russian airspace. This is not a warning, it is an order. For the Russian pilots, that moment was the end of all training, all propaganda, and all assumptions. Their superior speed and altitude were useless. Their powerful radars were no different from piles of metal. Facing them was a force that had already defeated them electronically, trapped them tactically, and now dominated them visually. The leader of the Russian fleet was aware of the tactical disaster he was in. They were outnumbered, technologically inferior, and most importantly, completely unprepared. When they tried to report the situation to their own ground control, the only response they got was the order, Turn back! Turn back immediately! Three MiG-31s retreated with a sharp turn, like a flock of birds fleeing a predator. The Gripen fighters did not let them go until they had completely left Estonian airspace. The F-35s, meanwhile, continued to record the entire retreat. The Russian pilots panicked maneuvers and their communication attempts, shadowing them like invisible specters. Not a single shot was fired at the end of this operation. But this was a defeat far more crushing than any physical clash. NATO had not only protected its airspace, it had also demonstrated, in a 12-minute lesson-worthy display, how helpless one of the most advanced fighter jets could be against a modern, network-centric warfare concept. Russian pilots returned to their bases not only with a mission report, but also with the jarring reality of how far behind their technology and tactics had fallen. After this incident, any subsequent deliberate and aggressive violation of NATO airspace would be met with lethal force under predefined conditions. This decision had the full support of Estonia, Poland, Sweden, and Germany. Even U.S. President Trump made his position clear. Well, I don't love it. I don't love it. I don't like it when that happens. Such rogue behavior should not be tolerated. They should be shot down if necessary. So, could NATO jets shoot down the MiG-31? On paper, the MiG-31 Foxhound's capabilities were formidable. With a service ceiling exceeding 80,000 feet, 
approximately 25 kilometers, and a speed of Mach 2.83, nearly three times the speed of sound, it was the world's fastest and highest flying operational fighter aircraft. So, how could such a target be stopped in an air-to-air -air combat? We saw how it could be stopped at low altitude on September 19th. Advanced electronic warfare, network-centric data sharing, and a combination of 4.5 fifth-generation fighters rendered the MiG-31 speed meaningless. But was the situation different at high altitude, on its own turf? The answer lay in the fact that the MiG-31's strengths were also its greatest weaknesses. The MiG-31 is not a dogfight fighter. It is a massive, aerodynamically crewed interceptor missile platform. Its design philosophy is based on hunting American bombers by flying in a straight line at incredible speeds. At Mach 2.8 and 80,000 feet altitude, this aircraft's turning radius is tens of kilometers. Attempting a sharp maneuver would either cause the aircraft to structurally break apart or its engines to stall, flame out, in that thin atmosphere. In short, it couldn't apply the G-force required to evade a modern air-to-air -air missile. It was a fast target, but also a target traveling in a straight line. On the other hand, its infrared and radar signatures are also a major disadvantage. Physics is unforgiving. A fuselage cutting through the air at Mach 2.8 generates tremendous frictional heat. When flying at this speed, the MiG-31 becomes a giant infrared beacon glowing in the sky. For modern electro-optical targeting systems, EOTS, found on aircraft like the F-35 or the latest generation of IR-guided missiles, AIM-9X, Sidewinder, ASRAAM. This is a perfect target that can be detected from hundreds of kilometers away. On radar, such a high speed instantly distinguishes it from slower targets due to the Doppler effect. It was impossible to conceal. Another weakness is electronic vulnerability. The September 19 operation proved that the MiG-31's electronic warfare and situational awareness systems are generations behind NATO standards. This situation did not change at high altitude. With the new engagement rules in place, the next MiG-31 violation may no longer be an intelligence gathering mission, but a kill mission. The systems NATO would use to carry out this mission rely on the lethal synergy of an integrated network rather than the capability of a single platform. Here are the key components of this network that could successfully target a high-altitude MiG-31. In air-to-air -air combat, the MiG-31 may appear unrivaled at high altitudes. However, at this point, the Gripen-E or a Eurofighter Typhoon enters the scene to play the role of the hunter. These aircraft may be flying at a lower altitude, such as 50,000 to 60,000 feet, like the F-35. They receive ready and processed targeting data from the F-35. The pilot pulls the trigger. The weapon launched is not a standard air-to-air -air missile. It is the MBDA Meteor. The Meteor has a solid fuel rocket motor as well as a ramjet engine. This means it can use air to fuel its engine and generate thrust for most of its flight. After launch, the Meteor climbs steeply, loft maneuver. While climbing to 80,000 feet, a standard missile would run out of energy and slow down. However, the Meteor's ramjet engine kicks in at this altitude and continues to accelerate the missile to speeds exceeding Mach 4. When a MiG-31 pilot receives a missile warning at a very late stage, they have two options, evade or maneuver. At Mach 2.8, they cannot escape a ramjet missile approaching at Mach 4 plus. Meteor reaches speeds of approximately 4,900 km per hour and maintains this speed. It is physically impossible for a MiG-31 traveling at Mach 2.83, approximately 3,465 km per hour, to evade a target continuously approaching it at Mach 4 plus. Attempting to maneuver is also physically impossible, as previously stated. Thanks to its enormous, no escape zone, the Meteor retains its energy and maneuverability until it reaches its target. For the MiG-31, this is a completely hopeless situation. Another impossibility regarding the MiG-31's escape is that the Meteor missile has a range of 200 kilometers. In air-to-air -air combat, there are many variables such as firing direction, angle, and so on. However, in a head-on engagement, a Meteor missile has a high probability of catching and shooting down a MiG-31 flying at high speed from a distance of 100 to 130 kilometers. Even in the most challenging scenario, i.e. high-altitude rear engagement, the Meteor missile can still intercept the MiG-31 from a distance of 30 to 50 kilometers. 
Another option for air-to-air -air combat is the latest version of NATO's standard BVR missile, the AMRAAM. This missile poses a serious threat to the MiG-31. Thanks to its increased range, more advanced rocket motor, and two-way data link, the AIM-120D can receive target updates from platforms such as the F-35 or AWACS, even after launch. The rocket motor propels the missile to approximately Mach 4, about 4,900 kilometers per second. Although it begins to lose this speed towards the end of its flight, this overwhelming initial speed advantage quickly closes the gap with the MiG-31, which flies at Mach 2.83. This forces the MiG pilot into defensive maneuvers that consume speed and energy to survive, making him an easier target for a second meteor or another missile coming from behind. In the operations room at Kayok Udom, when the red icons on the giant screen left Estonian airspace and headed east, there was not relief in the room, but quiet satisfaction. Russia's provocation had not only been countered, but also turned into an intelligence opportunity. The Russians' critical mistake was assuming NATO's presence in the Baltics was merely a symbolic air policing force. What they actually encountered was a dynamic and lethal integrated air defense system, capable of managing different generations of fighter jets from different countries through a single network with real-time data flow. What happened in Estonian airspace on September 19th was not just a successful interception operation. It was an event that fundamentally shook and reshaped NATO's defense paradigm in the Baltics. The atmosphere was tense at the closed-door meeting. Representatives from Estonia, Poland, and Sweden, then the alliance's newest member, argued that the long-standing, polite escort policy was now perceived by Russia as a weakness. They stated that Russia knew the limits of NATO's Rules of Engagement (ROE) and was consistently pushing those limits without paying any price. It was emphasized that the September 19th operation had demonstrated technological superiority, but that the next provocation could be much more dangerous. With Germany's support, a new and much tougher proposal was put on the table, the re-establishment of deterrence. This was not a declaration of war. It was a clear message to the other side about what the next move on the chessboard would be. After several days of intense diplomatic and military consultations, agreement was reached on a new engagement protocol. The question was no longer, will they do it again? But if they do it again, can we really stop them? Ultimately, NATO's capability is not just a technical superiority, but also a political message. The announcement of new engagement rules and the existence of a credible military capability to enforce them fundamentally changes the deterrence equation for Russia. The era of safe and cost-free provocations is over. The cost of the next deliberate violation could be not just a diplomatic protest, but also the loss of billions of dollars in strategic assets and highly trained pilots. The risk-reward analysis now clearly favors the West. Thank you for choosing us.